Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Hoot. We are in the middle of Chapter 10, and Roy and Beatrice are on some sort of mission where they need, like, gauze and some sort of first aid equipment, as well as ground beef. So they're pretending to do a science experiment at Beatrice's house, um, but we'll find out what's happening. Beatrice Leap lived with her father, a former professional basketball player with gimpy knees, beer gut, and not much enthusiasm for steady work. Leon Lurch Leap had been a high-scoring point guard for the Cleveland Cavaliers and later for the Miami Heat. But 12 years after retiring from the NBA, he still hadn't decided what to do with the rest of his life. Beatrice's mother was not an impatient woman, but she had eventually divorced Leon to pursue her own career as a cockatoo trainer at Parrot Jungle a tourist attraction in Miami. Beatrice had chosen to remain with her father, partly because she was allergic to parrots and partly because she doubted that Leon Leap could survive on his own. He had basically turned into a lump. Yet, less than two years after Mrs. Leap left him, Leon surprised everyone by getting engaged to a woman he met at a celebrity pro-am golf tournament. Lana was one of the waitresses in bathing suits who drove electric carts around the golf course serving beer and other beverages to the players. Beatrice didn't even learn Lana's last name until the day of the wedding. It was the same day Beatrice found out she was going to have a stepbrother. Lana arrived at the church towing a somber, bony-shouldered boy with sun-bleached hair and a deep tan. He looked miserable in a coat and necktie, and he didn't hang around for the reception. No sooner had Leon placed the wedding ring on Lana's finger than the boy kicked off his shiny black shoes and ran away. This was to become a reoccurring scene in the Leap Family Chronicles. Lana didn't get along with her son and nagged at him constantly. To Beatrice, it appeared as if Lana was afraid that the boy's quirky behavior might annoy her new husband, though Leon Leap seemed not to notice. Occasionally, he'd make a half-hearted attempt to bond with the kid, but the two had little in common. The boy held no interest in Leon's prime passions, sports, junk food, and cable television, and spent all his free time roaming the woods and swamps. As for Leon, he wasn't much of an outdoorsman, and he was leery of any critter that wasn't wearing a collar and a rabies tag. One night, Lana's son brought home an orphaned baby raccoon, which promptly crawled into one of Leon's favorite moleskin slippers and relieved itself. Leon seemed more puzzled than upset, but Lana went totally ballistic. Without consulting her husband, she arranged for her son to be shipped off to a military prep school, the first of several failed attempts to normalize the boy. He seldom lasted more than two weeks before running away or being expelled. The last time it happened, Lana purposely didn't tell Leon. Instead, she continued to pretend that her son was doing fine, that his grades were good and his conduct was improving. The truth was, Lana didn't know where the boy had gone and didn't intend to look for him. She was fed up with that little monster, or so Beatrice overheard her say on the phone. As for Leon Leap, he displayed no curiosity beyond what his wife had told him about her wayward offspring. Leon didn't even notice when the tuition bills from the military school stopped coming. Long before his mother sent him away for the last time, the boy and his stepsister had forged a quiet alliance. After Lana's son made his way back to Coconut Cove, the first and only person he contacted was Beatrice. She agreed to keep his whereabouts a secret, knowing that Lana would call the juvenile authorities if she ever found out. The concern was what had prompted Beatrice Leap to confront Roy Eberhardt after she saw him chasing her stepbrother that first day. She did what any big sister would have done. On the bicycle ride, Beatrice shared enough bits and pieces of her family story with Roy that he understood the difficult situation. And after seeing her stepbrother's wounds, he knew why Beatrice had run for help after she found him moaning inside the the old JoJo's ice cream truck. It was the first time Roy had been permitted to see the running boy up close and face to face. The kid was stretched out, a crumpled cardboard box serving as a pillow. His straw blonde hair was matted from perspiration, and his forehead felt hot to the touch. In the boy's eyes was a restless, darting animal flicker that Roy had seen before. Does it hurt bad, Roy asked. Nope. Liar, Beatrice said. The boy's left arm was purple and swollen. At first, Roy thought it was from a snake bite and worriedly glanced around. Fortunately, the bag of cotton mouse was nowhere in sight. I stopped by on the way to the bus stop this morning and found him like this, Beatrice explained to Roy, then to her stepbrother. Go on, tell cowgirl what happened. Dog got me. The boy turned his arm over and pointed to several angry red holes in the skin. The bites were nasty, but Roy had seen worse. One time his father had taken him to a state fair where a rodeo clown got chomped by a panicky horse. The clown was bleeding so badly that he was rushed to the hospital in a helicopter. Roy unzipped his backpack and removed the medical supplies. He knew a little about treating puncture wounds from a first aid course he had taken at summer camp in Bozeman. 
Beatrice had already cleansed her stepbrother's arm with soda water, so Roy lathered antibiotic ointment on a panel of gauze and taped it firmly around the boy's arm. You need a tetanus shot, the Roy, Roy said. Mullet Finger shook his head. It'll be okay. Is the dog still running around here? The boy turned inquiringly, inquiringly to Beatrice, who said, go ahead and tell him. You sure? Yeah, he's all right. She shot an appraising glance at Roy. Besides, he owes me. He almost got squashed in a closet today. Isn't that right, cowgirl? Roy's cheeks flushed. Never mind that. What about the dog? Actually, there was four of them, Mullet Fingers said, behind a chain fence. So how'd you get bit? Roy asked. My arm got stuck. Doing what? It's no big deal, said the boy. Beatrice, did you get some hamburger? Yeah, Roy's mom gave it to us. The kid sat up. Then we better roll. Roy said, no, you need to rest. Later. Come on, they'll be getting hungry soon. Roy looked at Beatrice Leap, who offered no explanation. They followed Mullet Fingers down the steps of the ice cream truck and out into the junkyard. Meet you there, he said, and broke into a full run. Roy couldn't imagine the strength it must have taken, considering his painful injury. As Mullet Fingers scampered off, Roy noticed with some satisfaction that he was wearing shoes, the same sneakers Roy had brought him from a few days earlier. Beatrice mounted the bicycle and pointed at the handlebars. Hop aboard. No way, Roy said. Don't be a wuss. Hey, I don't want any part of this, not if he's going to hurt those dogs. What are you talking about? Well, that's why he wanted the meat, right? Roy thought he had figured it out. He thought the kid meant to take revenge on the dogs by spiking the hamburgers with something harmful, maybe even poisonous. Beatrice laughed and rolled her eyes. He's not that kind of crazy. Now let's go. Fifteen minutes later, Roy found himself on East Oriole Avenue at the same trailer where the foreman had hollered at him a few days before. It was nearly five o'clock and the construction site looked deserted. Roy noticed that a chain-link fence had been erected to enclose the lot. He recalled the cranky foreman had threatened to unleash vicious guard dogs, and he assumed that those were the ones who had bit mullet fingers. Jumping off the bike, Roy said to Beatrice, Does this have anything to do with the cop car that got spray-painted? Beatrice said nothing. Or the gators in the portable potty? Roy asked. He knew the answer, but Beatrice's expression said, Mind your own business. Despite the fever and raging infection, her stepbrother had beaten them to the pancake house construction site. Let me have that, he said, snatching the package of meat from Roy's hands. Roy grabbed it back. Not until you tell me what it's for. The kid looked to Beatrice for assistance, but she shook her head. Get it over with, she told him. Come on, we haven't got all day. His injured arm hanging limply, limply mullet fingers clambered up one side of the fence and down the other. Beatrice followed effortlessly, effortlessly swinging her long legs over the top. What are you waiting for? She barked at Roy, still standing on the other side. What about the dogs? The dogs, said Mullet Fingers, are long gone. More confused than ever, Roy scaled the fence. He followed Beatrice and her stepbrother to a parked bulldozer. They huddled on the shaded cup of the blade, safely out of sight from the road. Roy sat in the middle position with Beatrice on his left side and Mullet Fingers on his right. Roy held a package of meat in his lap, cover covering it with both arms, like a fullback protecting football. Did you paint the cop car? He asked bluntly. He bluntly asked the boy. No comment. And hide the alligators in the toilet? Mullet fingers stared straight ahead, his eyes narrowing. I don't get it, Roy said. Why would you try crazy stuff like that? Who cares if they build a stupid pancake house here? The boy's head snapped around and he froze Roy with a cold look. Beatrice spoke up. My stepbrother got bit by the dogs because his arm got stuck when he reached through the fence. Now ask me why he was reaching through the fence. Okay, why, Roy said. He was putting out snakes. The same snakes from the golf course, the cotton mouse, Roy exclaimed. But why? Are you trying to kill somebody? Mullet fingers smiled knowingly. They couldn't hurt to flee those snakes. I taped their mouths shut. Oh, I'm so sure, Roy said. Plus, I glued sparkles on their tails, the boy said, so they'd be easy to spot. Beecher said he's telling the truth, Eberhart. Indeed, Roy had actually seen the sparkling tails for himself. But come on, he said. How do you tape a snake's mouth closed? Real carefully, said Beatrice with a dry laugh. Oh, it ain't so hard, Mullet Fingers added, if you know what you're doing. See, I was trying to hurt them dogs. Not trying to hurt them dogs. I was trying to rile them up. Dogs do not like snakes, Beatrice exclaimed. Makes them freak out, bark and howl and run around in circles, her stepbrother said. I knew the trainer would drag him out of here as soon as he saw those cottonmouths. Those Rottweilers aren't cheap. It was the wildest plan that Roy had ever heard. The only part I didn't count on, said Mullet Fingers, eyeing his bandage charm, was getting bit. Roy said, I'm almost afraid to ask, but what happened to your snakes? Oh, they're fine, the boy reported. I came back and got them, took them to a safe place and let them go. 
But first he had to peel the tape off their mouths, said Beatrice, chuckling. Stop. Roy was completely exasperated. Hold on right there. Mullet fingers and Beatrice looked at him matter-of-factly. Roy's head was spinning with questions. And we're going to stop there.